good evening everybody thank you for joining us uh, today's conversation is going to be about our planet our wildlife and us um, all of us understand that we are all connected there has to be a balance in nature uh, but samyukta with her expertise is going to break that down for us and particularly break it down from the standpoint of what really is the connection she says that there's it's not like covid-19 is a direct derivative of wildlife trade or any sort of uh, de degradation of the planet but there are very strong correlations and that's what uh, she will share with us uh, welcome back to another episode of within arms reach where we uh, try to extend our collective reach and our collective growth samyukta is currently uh, head of forensics at the wildlife conservation trust However I'd like to make clear that she's not going to be speaking today as a spokesperson of the wildlife conservation trust she's here to speak uh, as an individual as a conservationist in her own right and as a forensic scientist uh, herself she has close to actually over 15 years of experience as a forensic scientist and she has 7 years of experience as a wildlife uh, conservationist before she um joined wildlife conservation trust as their head of forensics she was a uh, campaign manager for humane society of india she taught forensic science at uh, st xavier's college in mumbai and she she had also founded an organization called facts that advised and uh, consulted also provided training services in forensic science particularly with regard to investigation in wildlife crime she was a partner with that firm um uh, no longer is but she continues as head of forensics at wildlife conservation trust to train um why uh, to train on ground staff that help in mitigating wildlife crime she trains them how to use forensic science to mitigate to help trace and mitigate crime she also advises uh, better implementation of policy sam thank you for joining us Thank you. So, Sam, you know, uh, in the run-up to our conversation today, yeah, uh, I had put up a post uh, with with something that you had shared, not just with me, but you've also shared this in in an interview with the Hindu recently, uh, where yeah. they asked about <clears throat> China and the wildlife trade. Right? You'd said yeah. that while there is no direct connection with uh, COVID nineteen, the degradation of the planet and wildlife does have a bearing on. um things like dis uh, zoonotic diseases like uh, covid yeah. coming to human beings uh yeah. there were about 18 to 20 people who actually disagreed uh, with uh, me but i i didn't ask because you know i don't have the expertise to clarify can you explain yeah. to us what you mean by that please uh so uh, currently since we're all experiencing the corona virus and the effects of that i think that's it's a great time to understand uh, wildlife diseases and how uh, wildlife trade and the illegal use of wildlife can impact uh, human kind uh, so the the covid incident or the corona new novel corona virus incident that is currently caused covid 19 mm -hmm. broke out in wuhan which is uh, where a wet market was happening now for a lay person a wet primarily a market where live uh, animal or live wild meat is usually sold and mm -hmm. is a hot bed for disease mm -hmm. now when i say this what i mean is that in nature when you look at wild animals that are living and thriving as part of a habitat mm -hmm. all wild animals mm -hmm. will have certain kinds of pathogens naturally in them mm -hmm. which would normally never reach a uh, human kind mm -hmm. if they didn't come in direct contact with humans mm -hmm. however with the increasing hunting of wild animals mm -hmm. for consumption as wild meat mm -hmm. as well as the fact that uh, uh wild animals uh, are traded in several formats it increases the interaction between wild animals and humans which mm -hmm. then leads to the result of wild any diseases carried in wild animals to be easily transmitted uh to um 
humankind. So this is how zoonotic diseases spread commonly. And because wildlife trade is one of the leading causes of bringing wild animals out of natural spaces and bringing them into direct contact with mankind, mm -hmm. this is a two-way effect. One, it immediately puts humankind in direct contact with diseases that wild animals have. Mm -hmm. And two, it degrades the quality of the ecosystems in which these wild animals naturally live. Mm -hmm. That causes a ripple effect to humankind by degrading the environment in which they naturally live okay. and the natural protection that they are afforded by these ecosystems uh -huh. is then dropped down and uh -huh. that again makes them more susceptible to diseases. So which is why in a, such a situation it's very important to understand that when you degrade natural ecosystems mm -hmm. you either by removing wild animals for them or by uh, taking away wild animals that serve critical functions in those habitats, both ways you are degrading a natural ecosystem, which eventually will lead to the creation of diseases like the new coronavirus incident. Okay, so uh, let me see if I've, uh, so there are two ways in which one is that it brings uh, animal diseases, so eating uh, wildlife meat or the, the buying and selling of wildlife meat and other wildlife products uh, yeah. brings their diseases into uh, human habitation Correct. and also taking them out of their natural habitat beyond a certain extent. Because I'm yeah. guessing that some amount of consumption, I mean, the, the balance of the planet allows for some amount of consumption. Of course, right? of course, there is a certain amount of sustainable consumption that would have to happen for, for example, for tribes that are directly dependent on forest produce or wild animals as food sources or nutrition sources. Right. Then, of course, for those kind of people, there is definitely a requirement to consume them. Right. However, in current day circumstances, our needs in the markets that that provide wild animals either as pets or as meat have gone far expectations which is why now you have large quantum of wild animals available in quantities that can now spread pathogens that can be picked up by mankind okay okay and um, this and you said that the other way is that uh, the wild animals themselves their immunity starts becoming lower because it weakens their natural uh, no, it weakens the it no it weakens the immunity that humans um, okay. would have afforded to them because of the protection that natural ecosystems right. give them against such diseases right. coming to them. Okay. So when you start okay. to degrade those ecosystems, you're you're double folding the effect that would have of uh, diseases being prevalent in human kinds. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that you know wild tribes that live there and a certain amount of human uh, allowed. Um, I suppose you when you're talking when we are talking about excess, we mean um, wildlife trade towards ornaments, towards things like tusks and uh, perfumes, yeah. and uh, you know maybe the fashion industry. But then there are also industries yeah. like the pharma industry that uh, mm -hmm. use a, a lot of wildlife um, essences or uh, you know uh, wildlife products and. Uh, the WHO um, has, you said, recognized, not approved, but recognized Chinese medicine also as a valid medicine, which means that yeah. uh, they are technically allowed. But again, over there, I mean, how do you say how much is okay? And is what is your personal comment on Chinese medicine being uh, recognized and on animal extract being used in pharma? <laughs> Sure. So both in my personal and professional uh, stand is exactly the same that traditional Chinese medicine has mm -hmm. largely no founding in science. So a lot of the rec remedies that are recommended that make use of wild animal parts have no mm -hmm. have no founding in science. There's nothing that has been proven through uh, rigorous science. Uh, okay. Having said that, a lot of traditional medicine makes use of wild animal parts in large quantities and recommends them for a variety of uses. So, for example, pangolin scales are recommended for lactating women to increase lactation okay. or tiger bone is recommended to increase strength for people who have arthritis mm -hmm. or some, to go as far as to say sometimes even tiger, uh, tiger penis soup is recommended to increase fertility. Mm -hmm. So all of these are not based in science yet are propagated because of a certain cultural belief. Mm -hmm. Yet the effect that they have on wildlife is very devastating mm -hmm. because the demand that comes from these areas is very, very large. And this can have impacts far reaching into several other countries that don't themselves practice these medicinal systems, mm -hmm. but are source countries for where these wildlife are naturally found. And hence from here, a lot of wildlife trade takes place to meet this demand. 
okay okay and i and with the increase in globalization i suppose what happens in one country just like we're seeing today with covid-19 yeah. will naturally travel to another country so pretty much Absolutely. like climate change this is also a collective yeah. uh, uh, yeah. you know concern okay so Absolutely. i know that there are many uh, you know pet lovers also amongst our, our viewers here and a lot of the people yeah. who uh, showed interest in this conversation are also pet lovers yeah. um yeah. so you we talked about how wildlife carries certain pathogens and bringing yeah. them into human contact uh, could very well have brought us a zoonotic disease like coronavirus what about yeah. pet uh do it, will it be um, I, i know that the animal advisory board of india and the who have put out advisories saying that pets which constitutes dogs and cats do not yeah. um, give human beings coronavirus yeah. yeah yet people are abandoning their pets and killing and stoning them even uh, mostly yeah. in places uh, yeah. could you talk to us a little bit about the difference between wildlife and pets sure so sure. so like i said right in the beginning wild animals will always have certain kind of pathogens in them just like us humans have certain diseases we carry in our body and we could mm-hmm. transmit to others for example common cold for example we if if i were to pick up a common cold i can very easily transmit it to somebody else and wild animals also carry pathogens mm-hmm. in them one individual to another and you wait for the right time or the right environment to take over uh, their host immunity so for example mm-hmm. a cold if my immunity is already low or i've been eating the kinds of things that will trigger my immunity to catch a cold i will pick up a cold yeah. but these are yeah. things that are natural however yeah. this in wildlife a lot of the pathogens that are seen can be yeah. lethal to mankind because normally you wouldn't be exposed to those pathogens on a regular basis because you don't come in contact with wildlife yeah. however with pets and here i'm speaking specifically of dogs and cats yeah. and dogs and cats are universally known as companion animals mm-hmm. over generations and eons and and lifetimes of having lived with these animals we have developed a large level of immunity to diseases that can pass between us okay but having said that there are still a lot of diseases that can come for example a dog your pet dog could catch rabies mm-hmm. and if you are not vaccinated against rabies you could pick that up from the dog and if your dog right. has not been vaccinated so yeah. it's all about maintaining basic dignity uh, basic hygiene and basic vaccinations mm-hmm. and ensuring that your pet animals have the correct vaccinations and are not exposed to any other infections that you could pick up however something like the coronavirus like the who has already pointed out and the animal welfare board of india has also said can not come from companion animals to humans it okay. can only come from wild animals okay all right um what about um, you know i know that you yourself are uh, a vegan uh, a vegetarian but um, there are a whole lot of us who do consume uh, meat um, you know edible yeah. meat um are there any dangers with meats with with poultry with birds if you, birds are also it's with any animals. it's hmm. yeah even in the poultry industry there's a lot of disease that is uh, seen in the birds because of the close unhygienic condition in which most poultries maintain animals or mm-hmm. they keep animals which is why a lot of meat that comes from traditional poultry is is injected with large volumes of antibiotics to keep those disease to keep those infections at bay mm-hmm. uh, wild animal meat also carries its own pathogens for example even with pigs if you were to eat pork that has not been cooked well you could pick up tapeworms and that can go to your brain and you can die mm-hmm. so the risk of con- attracting disease from eating even plants you could pick up something you could pick up a fungus or you could have upset or you could have an allergic thing the item that you eat will have a certain amount of risk however with wild animal meat the risk is higher simply because again like going back to the first point the pathogens that are in those in that animal is far stronger far more virulent mm-hmm. uh, than what is seen in your poultry and other things and poultry and, and uh, most pork uh, meat mutton fish all of these are have been are usually cured for human consumption to make them human consumption safe that's mm-hmm. not to say that you can't pick up infections that come like salmonella infections you could pick up from badly cooked meat mm-hmm. there are numerous cases that are reported across the world of of meat that has gone bad that is called food poisoning so all of these are common incidents so it's just a question of ensuring that people know what the risk is of a certain thing however with wild animal meat the risk is not just to your own self it's also pulling that animal out of its ecosystem risking removing and also if when you look at it from a larger perspective eating wild animal meat is illegal you are not allowed in india to hunt wild animals for meat unless you have specific permission then you come from a tribal community who depends directly on that wild animal meat for consumption for uh, sustenance 
Okay, so you know uh, when we were talking about the pets, you talked about a, a companion immunity that we've uh, uh, you know developed yeah. over the years. Now let's take pig meat for instance, right? Yeah. Uh, pig meat has been eaten by uh, by tribes and you know by by people like let's say the Kurgis. Pork is a very integral part of their yeah. um, uh, of their diet. So. and likewise mutton for some communities chicken for some other communities fish for some communities yeah yeah we may have developed some amount of immunity uh, towards diseases yeah. that they carry would that be a safe assumption to make so well immunity of course they would come and i'm sure people like the kurgis know exactly how to cook their fish uh, cook their pork well in mm -hmm. fact fugu which is made from uh, uh, you know the puffer fish which is an extremely toxic fish mm -hmm. uh, there are chefs who undergo training mm -hmm. for over a decade to learn how to cut the fish so that people don't die from the consumption of it mm -hmm. that's a separate that's a separate issue altogether mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. immunity apart eating wild animal meat while in the original times when the kurgis and yeah. other people were still smaller tribes was a mm. means of sustenance mm. however we are now in a in a time frame where everyone has access to much better nutritional resources mm -hmm. however we've lost we've lost a lot of volumes of wild animal populations with this demand for wild animal meat okay. and the thing that people forget is that Mm. poultry cattle all of these while they suffered their own kind of cruelty while being raised for uh, meeting uh, you know for meeting the demands of uh, consumption that people would have mm -hmm. wild animals also serve roles in ecosystem so for example a wild boar mm. its role is to to raise up a lot of soil to churn mm. the soil to eat up a lot of the pests that would normally uh, perhaps attack a few plants and trees so they are playing critical roles in those ecosystems which if you remove those animals or large volumes of those animals then it's very hard to sustain uh, those ecosystems in good health and in the large in the larger larger picture that then obviously has ripple effects on mankind as well okay so you know whether uh, the common man the common people agree with this or not because many times even if we know that yes there is a larger connection and it's important to maintain the balance in uh, the yeah. ecosystem we do tip off uh, yeah. the balance but governments yeah. and regulatory bodies that are concerned with wildlife and environment conservation um one yeah. would assume that they up they fully understand the implications and would be coming down that much harder on any anyone who's violating uh the laws uh, against wildlife and uh environments but uh, that's not what yeah. the news says the news says that that there's every chance that it may have ramped up uh so can you can you yeah. tell us about yeah. so uh, you work that, actively in this space that's Yeah this is a this has become a bit of an ironical situation where you would not expect that something like this would shake all of us out of our sleepy behavior towards environment and say oh my god now each of us needs to do something to you know safeguard the environment and suddenly there's this news that everyone's flooding each other with about oh look at these wild animals they're everywhere now because we are no longer on the roads there are people who've gone to the extent of calling humans the pests of the planet and saying oh my god now that we are not there you know and all of that jazz but the key thing to remember birds. <laughs> yeah you look you're wearing all the colors of one rightfully so i've learned how to camouflage myself well which is why i'm dressing somber now so yeah <laughs> occupational hazards these are okay. yeah so uh, so yeah so i um, so there are two this flip sides to it so when corona virus came out a large number of ngos across the world uh, got back uh, started to hit back at china and say hey see look we've been talking about the fact that you as a one of the key countries that pushes illegal wildlife trade because of your demand uh, now needs to take action against this because look at what's happening in the world so there's been a lot of pressure on china to shut down their uh, markets and they have taken a government decision to shut down all wildlife markets but the fact is that for many years now wildlife trade has been moving online so even whether or not you have it available at the next door wuhan market it's still available on some website somewhere so the market has not died just the way it's available is is shifted right um mm. and the second thing to look at is that that's happening in china which is where where corona virus broke out mm -hmm. in countries like india which have been so vastly hit by it right. this situation seems to have raised a lot of awareness in the general public's mindset like i suddenly have a lot of people who didn't care about wildlife mm -hmm. say hey you know tell me about this so what's with this and what's with that so there's a new evoked interest which is very heartening 
However, there's this wonderful government, and I'm glad you said I'm not speaking on behalf of WCT in the beginning mm-hmm. because I can be as candid as I like. Is that this government is now making a mockery of the situation because they are now threatening to release policies like the uh, environment investigation uh, policy, which will now dilute a lot of the progress that NGOs and governments have collaboratively made to protect mm-hmm. environment better or to act as safeguards or watchdogs against badly planned. projects that could have rolling impacts on uh, wildlife so yes. one such contentious issue for example was the is this dam that is being planned in dibang valley mm-hmm. which uh, you know uh, the ministry saying oh yeah yeah we should go ahead with this because suddenly arunachal will have all this you know availability of water and so on and so forth mm-hmm. but the fact is that this dam is going to wipe out uh, the a uh, huge volume of land which the idu mishmi tribe is directly dependent on for their lives and their livelihoods and all also the area that the dam will break into is a key a habitat for a lot of very endemic uh, wildlife that is found in that region mm-hmm. so while we as as the vote bank as i'd like to think of us are thinking that the government is taking stronger step the reality is that the government is actually going in reverse if even if you don't care about wildlife i'm sure everyone's been hearing about the news about how ma- uh, migrant labor laws are now being diluted so right. the same situations yeah. happening with wildlife but a lot of the wildlife laws are now under threat of dilution because suddenly there's nobody to protest how do you protest if you can't congregate and protest if you can't right. get together and protest if you can't like how do you do so it's a very easy time for them to um, and i again as since i'm not talking is wct i can say this is that recently i was in conversation with a close friend and who also cares about wildlife and we were having this conversation and we said that if you think about it this is a ideal situation that the government would have wanted that the that people are behind closed doors they can't come out and protest yeah they can send letters but who's really going to come and knock at our door and say and take us to court because they can't go out to go to court this is a great time to push stuff that they would have always wanted to push because now suddenly they, there's a certain sect of the vote bank that's only worried about the economy me and wants to see action that is going to boost the economy but yeah, um, that that that's a fair point and in fact uh, a friend yeah. of mine uh, ankita had shared an article in which you know there was some perspective drawing about whether the lockdown is also about uh, you know a step towards dictatorship and these were not her yeah. words she shared an article written by yeah. um yeah. somebody einstein i can't remember but you know uh, just just to, in response to that while i i see that perspective i think uh, sitting at home we have a much greater power which is the internet to have conversations like this and while uh, and to also speak up in uh, you know as individuals and while earlier yeah we could gather in a group physically in a certain place yeah. and protest nobody yeah. uh, was 100% sure of what happened at the pro- protest what was being yeah. said how did the police clamp yeah. down today the whole world will be watching what's happening in every other part of the world because everybody absolutely yeah so absolutely i really hope too. that absolutely and in fact i now hope that following this at least a lot of these wonderful people who have joined who i don't know personally i can see a lot of people have done some work yes. with also on this call i hope yes. that they will use this opportunity to actually you know think about their own awareness of wildlife because that's where half the battle is right like what do you understand yes. about wildlife or what do you understand about your environment and how right. do you want to know it better because suddenly if people think that us being locked away as mankind mm-hmm. is allowing wildlife the confidence to come out in force mm-hmm. there's something that was amiss all this while right like somebody i heard on the radio this morning calling this the new normal right so what was right. so wrong with the past that we need to now open our minds to because we lived perfectly fine with it so far so why is this now suddenly right. making us so intrigued you know right. so yeah so uh, also uh, sam with regard to the dilution of uh, you know the laws that you talked about uh, yeah. in our conversation uh, in the run up to this you'd also mentioned that india has actually one of the strongest acts towards wildlife yeah. protection uh, is that yeah. correct uh, so absolutely where where is uh, the lacuna where uh, why is the implementation so weak 
uh, the wildlife protection <laughs> act which was in which was uh, created in nine as far back as in 1972 mm-hmm. uh, was created with the purview of creating ecological and environmental security for the country mm-hmm. not to say that the act was the most perfect act however in terms of uh, clamping down on uh, wildlife crime in terms of giving power to the actual forest guard who works in the forest mm-hmm. it is a very empowering it's a very liberating act and it enshrines a lot of unique powers that a lot of other uh, special acts that were created for specific situations don't have mm-hmm. so it's a very strong act and a lot of neighboring countries and us have have in recent years been in talks with india to replicate uh, some of this stuff in their own country okay. but having said that the problem is at the ground level that as a nation while we have had an act as far back as in 1972 mm-hmm. uh, the way the budgets are made annual mm-hmm. center budgets that are made for forest departments are are poor uh, they are constantly understaffed they have several issues of they don't get the right kind of equipment or they are working in conditions that even the most toughened soldier in the army and i can say this because i'm a child who grew up in the army i've seen mm-hmm. forces at the, at the borders lived with them because you know my father was posted there yeah. i've seen this first hand i know that even they had better amenities for themselves and their families than the forest guard so it's worse off in the sense that the infrastructure is poor they work in extremely tough conditions where very often they don't see their families for weeks on end their families don't have access to government given healthcare very often or schooling systems so they often have to put their families far away from them so um, yeah so these are the things that one has to keep in mind when one talk looks at wildlife conservation it's not just about the law it's about the people who are empowered to enforce those laws very often are not given the tools with which to enforce them so while the the apathy for wildlife exists in the department while the interest exists it's just that their circumstances are so hard that it's just not easy to enforce law the way we think the law should be enforced okay uh so sam um, you know i have one last but i think the most important question and after yeah. that uh, we'll take questions from our audience um sure while the government implementation may be weak um you know um uh, and while there may be a lot of apathy us uh, human beings we still live in a democracy we're still allowed to make our own uh, choices what can yeah. we as human beings do differently uh, to help curtail illegal uh, wildlife trade so i think there's a it's a very fundamental question and the answer is extremely simple uh, is that each of us while we may not get out there and you know give up our corporate jobs and go work in conservation we're not asking anyone to do that is that i think all we need the, anyone and everyone in this country is to be aware of a couple of things one what is what is the law say right so what does your country's mm. wildlife law say so for mm. example what kind of animals does it protect what kind of um uh provisions does it make or what kind of areas are declared as national parks tiger mm-hmm. reserves and not just looking at them as places of tourism interest but looking the, at them as interest as as being a biodiversity sinks mm-hmm. two is understanding the relationship that uh, you share with nature mm-hmm. is not just a cultural relationship like you and i have grown up in communities where you and i in this call up lead to this call up you said that uh you know we were encouraged to to uh, experience wildlife and so on so even though you may not have that had that future or had that past i think it's very important to understand that all our futures are directly linked to the sanctity of our wild spaces because you and i and anyone in the world wants to open their tap and have good great quality water coming out of it mm-hmm. and if you want to do that we can't do that without securing our forests because that's where water originates Right. And if you want to wake up in the morning and breathe great clean air and not worry about getting coronavirus and other such diseases we have to ensure that our wild spaces are absolutely clean and available uh, in good healthy conditions so that not just our generation but following generations mm-hmm. will also benefit from that you know like right now i was just recently working on a, with a financial planner to look at my financial uh well then you know where do i need to go what kind of investments do i need to make and one mm-hmm. of the exercises she made me do which got me thinking was succession planning mm-hmm. and i was like hey listen i am never going to have kids mm-hmm. but it got me thinking about the fact that every single instrument that we as people on this planet do is to put away things for our next generation mm-hmm. and so we need to think about our natural spaces also as that is things that we can safeguard so the next generation also has the great quality of lives that we've enjoyed 
or continues to enjoy uh, that and not just because of our health but also all so many of our cultural associations our religious associations come from wildlife or wild spaces uh, you know so many of our stories that we've all grown up listening to has a sparrow or a snake or a cat or a whatever animal it is that you find uh, you want to associate with so all of these things are extremely extremely critical to understand mm -hmm. and whether or not you feel direct compassion for wildlife or to feel direct compassion for nature to understand that the choice you make will have an impact and the impact those consumer choices will have on uh, the uh, provision of wildlife either it is a pet or is an ornament or in the pharma industry or is food so just consumer choices also is extremely critical aware of okay firstly sam i'd like to uh, you know comment on that beautiful parallel you drew between succession planning in our finances the amount of care we take and succession planning in terms of our future and investing for the future i think that's such a yeah. beautiful uh, parallel um, amongst the other things you shared about being aware of what our wildlife laws say uh, about yeah. uh, understanding our consumer choices now okay yeah. uh, one uh, is where can we find um, you know the wildlife law the at least the preamble uh, where can we find that and read it um yeah. and second thing is about consumer choices now there are uh, products that say we do not test on wild animals or uh, we do not use you know just says we products. don't test on animals we yeah. don't yeah. test on animals yeah or that yeah. Uh, yeah. we don't use any animal extracts things like that yeah. so uh, consumers yeah. who have some amount of awareness uh, Uh, we'll look at that and and make up their mind. But then you know, many times yeah. you hear that even that is not good enough. Is is that correct? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean that they they may be subverting something else somewhere and including it in their product. Is is that uh, is that true? Because that's what we hear many times when it says no oh, animal so I, testing. I think. Stuff. I think the parallel to think about, if I've got your question right, is that very often in my own office, for example, we have this debate of, uh, you know, we're saving the environment, but we're working in an AC office. So um, how are we offsetting this this right, thing, right? Right. Yeah. So the same way to think about it is your consumer choices. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the level of impact it can have, right? So for okay. example, uh, recently it was a very interesting debate we had in my within my own team where there's this app that says know your fish, mm -hmm. which basically allows you to understand and track in in which breeding season which kind of fish should you not consume because they are currently breeding and hence consuming them can create a demand for them and hence they will be pulled out and breeding won't happen and they won't be able to produce next generation populations will decline so on and so forth and certain people in my team were of the opinion that this is not efficient this is not sufficient because it's like a placebo because then you're like how you're telling yourself i did this this is enough right so i think in a personal opinion I feel, and I'm somebody who decided to go vegetarian many years ago. I don't wear leather. I don't use products that are tested on animals. I don't wear silk. Uh, you know all this about me. I am veg, you know all of that. So I think it's a question of understanding uh, yeah. what choices of yours impact how, from just a personal perspective, and two, what is the legality of it? When we're talking about wildlife, understanding the legality of it is very important. So if I go out and choose to buy. Um, a piece of jewelry that has coral or buy some ivory because i think it's beautiful i must keep it in my home you must understand that you're not just taking a wildlife product that hurts a wild species but you're also committing an illegal act so there's that quantum of differentiation that you need to understand and understand what you're offsetting with what so you talked about this app for fish but are there other places yeah. where we can actually go and find out what kinds of products uh you know oh absolutely the the information is uh, is a well for this uh, the sorry the internet is in, is a well for this information okay. uh, know your fish is one of these unique apps that is really good and everyone who eats fish or likes to eat fish should at least start by you know educating themselves with that app okay uh, wct wwf a bunch of organizations regularly and sagels on this call sagel who does some fabulous uh, you know um, walks in within cities to talk to people about marine life that live in cities that have shores so mm -hmm. just finding avenues for educating yourself there are su sufficient and more so if you were to just go on to all ngos that work in the wildlife space if you were to just go through their websites there's sufficient and more information available there but if okay. anybody on this call particularly wants specific information i'm happy to share it with them through an email or 
Okay. So you said know your fish. WCT website, WWF website, World Wildlife Fund. WWF, right? yeah. yeah. There's a whole bunch. Are WTI there, yeah. traffic, yeah. WTI. Uh, w WTI traffic. traffic, yeah. Okay. There's also right. the UNODC, which is the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes, that regularly puts out some very interesting information. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at the uh, UN website, they regularly celebrate World Wildlife, whenever World Wildlife Day comes out and they have interesting information. So those are available. Uh, Sejal is asking a related yes. question on this. You want yeah. to address so, uh, yeah. Sejal, before Sejal, uh, uh, thanks for asking Sejal. I'm going to come to your question in a minute. Anil Kumar Sakur, who had asked a question a little before, he yeah. said, any yeah. comments on the Vizag gas leak from LG polymers, which had taken many animal lives, where uh, no one addressed this? Uh, I think it's unfair to say no one addressed it. Uh, I'm glad you are aware of it and are concerned about animal life, but it's unfair to say no one addressed it uh, because I know at least of three NGOs that work in the wildlife space, one of uh, animal welfare space, one of who was my ex-employer, the Humane Society in, uh, International uh, India office, who got together, put out advisories. I know that WTI had uh, helpline numbers available where people could call and inform them and they would send out teams to... Uh, help with animal cases. So the thing is that I think just because I work in the wildlife space and my circle is is these conservation, animal welfare thing, I'm more informed. But if you start to grow your circle, you will obviously then become more and more aware of the fact that these people are out there doing something. And definitely yeah. the Animal Welfare Board of India would have definitely done some uh, address this situation. And, you know, I have a perspective again to offer there. Uh, just like with the migrant laborers, see, we started talking in India about the migrant laborers quite far off, right? Initially, when yeah. coronavirus yeah. started and the lockdown happened, nobody was really talking as much about the migrant laborers. Then uh, yeah. the conversation started. Then there was a camp down on the trains in Karnataka because yeah. people wanted to keep them back to work, right? So yeah. uh, one yeah. wonders why there was no conversation. And I think likewise, um, sometimes we don't hear of some things. Samyukta's in the space, so maybe she's heard of it. And sometimes I wonder that maybe if we haven't heard that so and so has uh, so and so action has been taken. Uh, so like, for example, in my last role with the Humane Society International, my last, uh, we would make it mm -hmm. the point with every disaster that would happen to reach out to the media, talk to them about how many animals mm -hmm. are affected and what people are doing, use the general common media to put out helpline numbers as far as we could. So uh, situations like this, honestly, media doesn't cover them because, again, it's a question of vote banks, speaking to the vote bank and animals are no one's vote banks, right? So it's easy to talk about human use and human issues, in, especially in terms of crisis. But it a lot more time, energy, and efforts to media to talk about wildlife conservation, wildlife trade, and uh, animal uh, rights issues. Having said that, in the past years, even with WCT, even with my time with HSI, media is definitely warming up to these concerns. And there's some fabulous reporters out there who are extremely active and do some fabulous stuff. It's just a question of engaging them on a more regular basis so that they also have uh, the wherewithal to talk to the editor and say, hey, this piece is going to garner attention. Let's put this out there. So it's all a question of, of people like everyone who's on this call wanting to hear this news. And hence, the press will say, oh, this is news that will catch eyeballs. And hence, putting the news out there. But that will only happen when people are aware and start asking the right kind of questions and want to know more. So unless right. the vote bank moves towards caring about wildlife and animals, the press and the larger government policy framework, it all ties back into people. So to add to your last question, if you care, then somebody sitting in the government will care, the press will care, everybody will care and want to bring you news, want to bring you better policy to tackle this. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Anil, for asking the question. And thanks, Sam, for the detailed response. Uh, Sejal's question is, what sort of spaces yeah. can we find out uh, that something is illegal just by the Wildlife Protection Act? Or are there other spaces where people can find out? Also, if you could tell us where uh, uh, we can find the Wildlife Protection Act. So the Wildlife Protection Act, there's an app available on your Play Store, I, I, you know, I store and uh, the uh, Google Play Store called the Wildlife Protection Act. You can download the app and use it mm -hmm. uh, or and you can read through or you can just buy a copy. It only costs 150 rupees mm -hmm. uh, and you can read through the act. It's fairly simple. It's very easily written. 
or you can just go online to uh, Mr. Know It All Google and ask him to just throw up the act for you and read it. It's a very fairly simple act. There's some shorter versions available, and even if you don't want to read the entire act, you just want to read the preamble just to get started. The preamble itself has some very interesting, simplistic language to get you uh, interested in what it says. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for answering yeah. that. Anil says this may appear uh, silly. But I wanted yeah. to know people eat chicken, mutton, and many animal products by killing them. I don't understand if this is uh, really under the Animal Protection Act. So, Sam, Wildlife Protection so, Act. So yeah, Act so the animal yeah. Protection? So they're two separate acts. So the Wildlife Protection Act only caters to wild spaces that have been defined as wild, which is, means that they naturally live and occupy wild spaces or wild habitats and what that wild habitat is also defined under the act so it's a natural park or it's a forest or anything that is defined under the act is treated as wildlife and there are six schedules under the act so six lists of different wild animals and plants that come under the wildlife that are covered under the ambit of the wildlife protection act mm -hmm. anything outside of that so for example uh, this gentleman has talked about chicken mutton animal products these would be covered under the Prevention of Anim Cruelty to Animals Act. So okay. there, there are rules stipulated as to how you can keep animals, what kind of care must you provide them, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's interested in just learning about these animals, you can even just go to the Animal Welfare Board of India's website. There's enough and more um, you know, things available. The Humane Society International put out this fabulous poster which had 15 laws that you must be aware of that are illegal to, you know, do with animals. So that's a great resource to look at as well. So there's enough and more information. But again, like I said, if somebody is specifically interested, I'm happy to take an email ID and share information. Okay. So yeah, they, if, if anyone would like to know about a specific area, uh, if you have any further questions, we can ask now. Otherwise, Samyukta is on uh, the uh, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Yeah. She'll see Samyukta or Samyukta Chemurupati. Samyukta spelled with a T and not with a TH. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you can reach out to her directly and she's always happy to share information about this. This is her life's passion. Um, yeah. I don't think there are any more questions, Sam. And uh, but we've had a lot of viewers. Uh, thank you, everybody, for um, for joining. Thank you us. for making thank the time. So yes. Take care. Thank, thank you, you very much, Sam. Speak to you soon. Thank you for having me. It was lovely doing this. Likewise. Likewise. Take care. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.